students from next year. Okay. Um, so last time we talked about financial legal side. Um, I'm gonna whip through the remaining stuff in the next half hour. Um, so marketing. What what is marketing? Anyone tell me? Um, making your whatever you made your thing you're selling more well known. Okay, so that's that's a, a large part of it, right? That's exactly more desirable. Yeah. Um, so so get uh, a big part of it is getting the word out there about it, helping to to make people aware of it and aware of its strengths and relevance to their needs, right? Trying to attract customers. Um, and there's a lot of different channels these days. Um, one that we've had some, some, some use with, and which I strongly recommend if you've never done it, is um, if you're thinking about marketing is uh, advertising uh, via Facebook or Google. Those support extremely targeted ads. You've probably seen these ads that follow you around, yeah. right? Or you've sent a message in Gmail about something, or you've searched for something, and then then an image of the thing or the topic follows you around where, you where you go. We talked about it near your phone. Yeah, is that right? Yeah, me and a buddy tested it for boats. We talked about boats just beside our phones for three hours, and we both got ads for boats. Did not, oh, no, did not turn our phones Phones on once during the conversation. And it was purely verbal. Yeah. It's kind of scary. Boats. Yeah, we're just talking about boats and like, like take going up for boating and really like saying all the things like going fishing as like they certain. This would be funny if every one of us gets an ad <laughs> after yeah, so this class. Ads on boats. <laughs> That's really interesting. Chainsaws, young man. Chainsaws. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Uh, <laughs> Uh, no, but, uh, yeah. So it's it's um, eerie sometimes, but you can actually reach certain subgroups of the population. Like you could target young men, you know, ages twenty to twenty four, um, who live in this part of the province with this sort of job. Um, it, it's amazing the level of detail you can get with advertising now online through Facebook and, and Google. Of course, there's large groups of the population now, but it's clear many young people are not on Facebook, and uh, and you know Google is another another option there. And there's lots of other opportunities, and often these vary. Like what's appropriate depends on the type of area you're you're trying to advertise. But you know these are some of them. And cold calls are still. What's a cold call? You want to say? It's some um, unsolicited call. Yeah, and, and it's particularly done. Cold calling is particularly done in the business world, like you'll call a, a business manager at a certain place and talk with them about your product. So it's not calling people at home, but calling people in, you know, in their offices to, to discuss the business proposition that you offer. It, it still is done, still is done. I know a company doing it. Um, so you know, you've got to get to know possible customers and, and cultivate them along. And there's a tension with sales, which I'll come to. By contrast to marketing, sales is about closing a deal. That's about getting to the deal, getting the customer to agree to something. And there's a tension with marketing. Anyone have an idea why? Why is there a tension with marketing? Because marketing takes money. Well, okay, there's, there's some truth to that. <laughs> yeah, you, you spend a lot of money in marketing or sales actually brings money in. Okay, what's another deal? Um, sales is usually more short term than marketing. That's true. So and, and marketing is often interested, I, I think sometimes often to its detriment in promising the sky. You get people interested. And then sales, sales can get pretty darn um, brass tacks. You know, you, you want more, you pay for more. You want, you want that feature, you're gonna pay twice as much. Um, Whereas in marketing, it's like, well, it can do this, it can do that, and and you get the idea, wow, you know, there's a lot there, but you're not clear about the cost side. In sales, the cost is key because it brings the money in. And often you get salespeople who are quite different from marketing people, and there's, there's sometimes a bit of resentment because marketing has cultivated this person who's really excited, and then they go to sales, and, and then it's like, what? <laughs> you're gonna crucify me? You know, you're gonna get money out of me like um, through my nose? I can't pay that. And you know, Mark, if you okay, we've lost, we've lost this this one. It took so long to to bring it up. So there's a key skill here: negotiation, understanding the client's constraints and structure, 
and figure out what you can give, how you can make a deal for this client. And I, in this class before, I've taught a, a module on negotiation. And actually, negotiation is is really interesting process. But basically, it involves figuring out when you have two parties, amongst other things, what your preferences are and my preferences, and by implication, what do you care about a lot? What do I care about a lot? And then trading off these things. Because there's things you care a lot about I don't really care much about. So you want a fancy title? I'll give you a fancy title. Sure, sure, no problem. Um, uh, I care about the, the money. You care about vacation. Okay, so I don't, I'm not that sensitive vacation-wise. Sure, have, have a bunch of vacation. Um, you want to start later than I would normally have you start. You know, I, I want you next month, but you want to start um, six months later. Um, that's not something I'm not willing to negotiate. And that's one, something I'm not willing to give up. And you have to decide if it's, if it's worth you uh, giving up on your side. So there's this kind of identification of preferences. And then a trade-off, so you get this win-win where you get a sense, I've got the important things for me, you've got the important things for you. It's a lot of fun, actually. Um, and sales can involve that. It's not just money only. It's often bundling things with it. Okay, I'll give you a license for twice as many clients as long as you get it for twice as long or something like that. Okay. Um, and uh, and you learn a lot from sales failures. What what didn't what didn't go? Um, you know, for custom and semi-custom, often. Often you can go to a client site. They'll pay you to come there and, and uh, do a sales visit. And you discuss the particular packaging you get. I, I next one of these. So we have some partners um, who, who got a sales proposition from a major company um, that sells a, a piece of software that's quite famous. And this company wanted to make a sales call. So they wanted to go to this client site and make the case for their product. And they wanted to make it by doing a little product for the project for them, okay? The only trick was they wanted to be paid $80,000 for doing this little project to sell them the full product. Um, so they, they said, well, look, why don't you pay us $80,000? We'll do a little project for you and then you can figure out if you want it. I said, like, no, no, this is not good. Because um, I figured it would be about half a day of work or something, or a day of work for them, and, and they'd walk away with 80, 80K, no matter if they make the sale or not. That's, but these things happen. You get clients who say, well, you know, bring me there, and I'll make the case in person. It's actually quite common when you're dealing with hundreds of thousands of dollars. They fly you, fly you out for a couple thousand dollars to, to talk, about, uh, talk about why it's a... It's a, it, it's a good value proposition. Okay, key thing. If you go into entrepreneurship, one of the most important things you gotta watch out for is the first client. First client is incredibly valuable. Well, it's hard to, hard to price it, hard to set the price on this. Um, one of the reasons is the companies that you're selling to um, uh, often they know, they know that this is your first client. So you're selling to a client who knows it's your first client. They know you need them. So they want it to be cheap. And often the companies want to sell to them. The, the startup will make it cheap. And that comes along with a bit of risk. It comes along with a bit of give, a bit of latitude, a bit of accommodation. Look, the software is new make it a real good deal for you, but you know we need you to help us figure out where the rough edges are to improve it for you. Um, the problem is that if you make it too cheap, then you can't pay your employees what they need to stay. <laughs> and you lose employees in the middle of the first client, which is disastrous. And I've seen one company go down precisely because of that. They couldn't keep a key technical person. They couldn't properly then manage the, uh, the client's technical infrastructure, and it was a bad experience for the client. If you do not impress the first client, often it's a kiss of death, because you don't get word of mouth, you're, you in fact get poor reputation, your credibility is shot, 
people talk about you know this uh, talking up the world and you're unable to deliver and it, and often you can't continue realistically or or it really puts a handicap in your in your, in your way um so sometimes you know this can be uh the end of a company either because of poor decision making or because uh you, you don't deliver properly okay uh, talk about um managerial issues Management in the uh, startup context is really difficult, whether you keep to a predefined plan and, or whether you engage with what the market seems to want right now, doing what your strengths allow you. If some people are really good at X, maybe we should do that instead of sticking to this original plan. Do we switch between different types of work as different clients come in? That's more of a custom model. Like each client gets something different, but then you're building up no IP. It's like you're you're not building up uh, an asset. You're you're just getting contracts and delivering on them and hand to mouth feeding yourself. This is the problem. You're, you you got to balance those things. Um, you got to manage the clients, balance the short and long term and uncertainty, um, and uh, and you know what you can realistically do. Um, often you're supervising people that are quite green and you got to prevent burnout, people from burning out uh, during these really intense uh, phases and uh, guarantee quality, quality delivery, which is tough as we'll talk about next time. Okay. And you got to head off partner problems. Um, now, the partners associated with startups are often thinking about an end game, how they're going to get out of this eventually. Like what is their mechanism for getting there. What's their hope for where this is going to go for them? And there's a couple options. Give me give me a couple options by which someone might be thinking long term where where they might be with respect to this company. There's at least three that are that are common. They want to stay with the company. Want to stay with it. And see it through. Yeah, they want to be the head. They want to be CEO on an ongoing basis. Not uncommon. Some people say, look, I, I want to lead this thing until it's a really big company. I knew one guy. He went through two he went through two startups, and it was on his third startup that he achieved his dream. He was the CEO for all of them. But what he really wanted to do was bring a company from getting, you know, something like hundreds of dollars a month to getting hundreds of millions a year. And he did. His third startup did the trick, um, and you know he he really relished that. Um, so some people want that. What's another thing some people want? To cash out. Cash out. This is the other really big thing. They figure, look, once this gets really big, someone's going to want to buy it. I want Google to buy it. I want Apple to buy it. I want to. I want to be bought out by a big firm and I as a founder will get a couple million and yeah, that's it. Uh, others will sometimes aim for roles like I want to be CTO, not CEO, a CEO or, or CEO, but a CTO. I want to be the chief technology officer you know, for this um, or I want to be chief architect and, and so on, but it's still stay with the company. So these are these are different um, goals, and often partners will have hopes along these lines. Um, uh, and you know, when it comes to different companies, you can get buyouts. Buyouts are possible. I mentioned what they look for, including partner issues. Um, uh, you can get strategic partnerships between companies. So I provide plug-in solutions for your product. And we both win, for example. Um, or we bundle our project products. You handle this side, I handle that side. We bundle them, and they work together really well. Right? Um, not not an unusual thing, and very desirable. Okay, let's talk about human resource issues. I mentioned before employees versus partners. Partners are the folks who co-own the company. Employees work for the company. Often, employees are nine to five. Partners are whenever to whenever. Um, 
and partners are typically fewer uh, than um, than employees, and employees are often more ephemeral than, than partners. Um, so partners are are comparatively rare to to bring on, although sometimes in the first uh, year or two, you know, partners get brought on uh, for uh, for many startups. Um, for several employees, set the culture. You know, sometimes said, you want to bring on the A level employees, so you have a top quality institution, and A level people attract A level people. That, that's sometimes said. Um, what's certainly true is there's a there's a um, culture setting, so the people who come on first set the tone, like how long hours are people expected to work. What's their attitudes towards quality assurance? What sort of standards do they put into place across the company? How hackerish is it versus rigorous software engineering is it? Um, uh, you know, what's what's the culture as far as uh, taking time off, et cetera? Okay. Um, so first level employees are often um, uh, key, and then who you get. <laughs> Often depends a lot on risk. So sometimes you get risk lovers. Sometimes you find people who are secure and looking for a challenge. People who are fresh out of school have little, little to lose. People who are on the fence, uh, employees elsewhere and want to come on. You got to watch out for these sort. These are often the least valuable employees from elsewhere. And they just want, they want to you know, sign on for something that will pay them. And they're not particularly great assets. And then there's sort of nepotistic ideas where you hire your family members and and bring them on and work with them, people who, who uh, need some help. And and I would say also here, you know, people uh, excited uh, by the vision. So, you know, in tech firms, often you will have some sort of tech vision behind this. People will say, that's really cool. You know, um, I want to use, I want to do... Uh, uh, Oculus-based, um, um, you know, training within Oculus for mechanical repairs for cars. That's cool. Or for jet engines. You know, I'll, I'll have augmented reality with an Oculus-type interface where it projects it on what I actually see and it will show me, you know, where to insert the part and show me a complete description of what's in front of me to, to help me know you know what part does what and guide me you know to a to what's needed to change a certain part and maybe they're really excited by working in 3d in cutting edge you know disruptive tool um so i talk about founders versus non-founder partners often big differences in equity stake initially founders get often big shares non-founding partners four percent three percent if you know if, if they're not in that first wave and then employees okay so partners you got to be really careful to pick partners these are people you're going to go through thick and thin with um sometimes you're going to go through really rough periods um you're not getting paid enough you're you know you're not sure what to do because the you know, first few clients you were hopeful about um didn't in the end bite um, you know, do you change your vision? Do you stick to this? These are folks you really want to work with well, really enjoy working with, really feel they're in, of integrity and they're not going to screw you over. I tell you, um, there are horror stories. We don't have time to go into them, but if you're interested separately in knowing more stories, be glad to tell you about stories of, you know, partners have screwed each other over, et cetera. And it's really bad. And it leads to lawsuits and it leads to recriminations and broken friendships for years. Um, be, beware of in, uh, imbalances and allocation of risk, where one partner is sitting pretty at a company, still has the same shares as someone who's working their butt off. It ain't right. Right, right. There, there needs to be acknowledgement. And sometimes between friends, they don't feel good saying this. They don't feel good coming out with a statement like, you know, hey, I'm not being treated right here. You should be able to say that with a friend, but sometimes that doesn't come out. Similarly, often friends don't get other friends to sign things in writing. You got to get that done. Um, uh, and 
you know, um, you got to really find out, and this is a key point. Do you really like entrepreneurship or do you like the idea of entrepreneurship? There's a big difference. The idea of entrepreneurship sounds all romantic and fine. At the end of the day, do you like taking your trash out? Do you like having to deal with the bills for monthly internet access and the phone bills and you know dealing with getting your own website up and all that sort of stuff? Um, setting up everything from scratch or would you prefer to work for a company where all that's taken care of for you you know a company as an employee i mean look as tech folks most companies that hire us if you go to a vendast or you got to even skip the dishes or you go to you know um uh what was point point two now is yardy or you go to uh solito or what have you they have they have HR people take care of things. They take care of the bills for the office space and so on. You barely don't have to worry about much besides your technical stuff. In an entrepreneurship stuff, in the entrepreneurship area, you have to worry basically about everything. Pay your monthly bills for your space. You have to go looking for new space when you get bumped out of yours and and you know, you're gonna be dealing with going shopping for chairs. Is that are you really up for it? Um, that's an important question. Or is it just you like the kind of nice idea of entrepreneurship, but you're not really into the day to day? So you want partners who are willing to take on scut work. Scut work meaning it's not very glamorous. It's, it's uninspiring, but it's needed. I had one business partner, still an entrepreneur, started two companies with me. He, uh, he said, he believes the key to successful entrepreneurship is being willing to shovel shit longer than anyone else. Sure. And there's some truth to that. There is some truth to that. Being able to stick through it, you actually get to the point where, on his case, you know, he did well with a multinational, he, I mean, it, it went to a multinational company, um, one of those companies we founded. Pretty good. Um, but scut work is needed in big time. Um, making your own car rental reservations, own plane tickets for many years. You know, um, uh, you have to have commitment to teamwork. This is not a place for coding cowboys who just want to, you know, don't bother them. They just want to do their thing. Um, it's got to be good chemistry between people. Uh, uh, people have to be compatible in terms of risk tolerance or be compensated otherwise. Um, and time commitment is a big deal. It's a difficult thing to discuss, but um, if you have several partners, one of them can only work nine to five because they have caregiving responsibilities at home or they have big obligations to their community and the others are working there till 10 at night. Unless they really manage that in terms of reward and so on, there's gonna be resentments which come up. People are gonna say, well, look, you weren't here when this happened, you know, um, how do you know? Or, you know, um, we've been working our butts off and, and you have, and, and it gets really bad with recriminations. So either it needs to be handled from the get go in a really straightforward, in a really central way, or, or it's a, it's a danger sign. Um, ability to work under stress. Um, <laughs> I remember that really well. I won't go into it right now, but uh, stress is a big part of entrepreneurship. Um, you're going to go demo in front of the client tomorrow morning. The system's not ready yet. Um, can you pull it together? Um, there's this darn bug with React Native and Redux. And you know, you gotta, you've got a demo in two hours. Uh, are you going to be able to pull it off? Um, it's, it's, it's not for the faint of heart. Um, and you got to deal with ups and downs really well, like clients that don't work out. So in addition to what's going on in the office, you want on-call people. You want to have a legal person, an accountant. Maybe this is through an incubator. That's great if you can get one through there. Uh, in other words, if you're in an incubator, I, I would recommend it strongly. But it costs something, and you know they're not everywhere. Um, there are several incubators in town, some good ones, um, down by the farmer's market. Um, there's also co-working spaces spaces where several companies kind of work together in a more flexible way. So um, 
is it 320 20th Avenue is uh, is a nice co-working space within a lot of growing companies and then eventually they often move out to a new new place once they get sufficient size but you want legal folks accountant folks um, maybe someone who's a domain expert I mean if you're selling to hospitals you want someone like Dr. Waba to be on call to be able to talk with them and be able to talk to them okay you know what do we do for so we can cl clue you into things like nurses aren't comfortable having their names their last name that sort of stuff right um, business development specialist someone who cares about the UI side um, you know you get software engineers sometimes who consider the UI the snout you know they don't like dealing with the snout because they somehow think it's boring and so you want someone who likes the snout and making the snout pretty right at least put some lipstick on it so it, it doesn't look so bad right uh, um, and sometimes you get people on an equity basis or you pay them so I remember one guy we had for my first startup as an accountant he had he got some amount of equity in the company so he was happy with that wouldn't charge us beyond a certain certain uh, certain element space um, a lot of software companies I've been in or I've seen run out of homes um, it's a hard thing how do you meet with a client so okay the client wants to meet you from a big you know fortune 500 company they come to town they want to see your system demoed and talk turkey with you about adapting it to their environment maybe it's Merrill Lynch maybe it's you know uh, Dow Chemical whatever they're gonna come to town they want to visit you okay your, your office is your home <laughs> what do you do um, <laughs> yeah or you rent you rent a room in a hotel you know they have uh, function rooms they have boardrooms that, that's what they're for it's like you have really formal meetings in a really nice looking boardroom or you're in a shared co-working space where they have a shared board room, boardroom so a co-working space will often have one boardroom and maybe five different companies and a company can use the boardroom can rent can reserve it for a certain time so clients come visit they see a really nice experience nice boardroom there's a kitchen you can get them tea or whatever and and uh, and you know they can still go through a quality experience without showing them your bedroom right I knew one company was run out of a closet for a while <laughs> and uh, yeah it's it's an awkward awkward thing uh, incubators are great um, for example, Mars. Uh, so, so uh, I've been associated with, associated with a company that was based in Mars for a while, and in um, in uh, uh, the Toronto area. Um, that's a thriving tech startup scene, and and really good. Um, and you can get semi dedicated space. We've done this before. Where uh, so there was a, a guy who ran a uh, uh, ran a server out of a, a space, and. He, ran, he rented this huge room and he only had a server in one part of it. And so we rented the rest of the room, like half price. You know, and we watched out for his server and he was perfectly happy. He didn't have to pay as much. We went. Um, okay, um, that's all I'm gonna uh, talk about. I mean, I, I listed some issues, like what are the issues at different stages, like pre-market, you know, um, pre-founding, What's our business model? Who among our founders? What market are we aiming at? Um, who will be our first clients? Is someone already big doing this? Who's our competition, in other words? And then you get post-founding you know, issues, and then small stage one, small stage two, medium size. Um, yeah. Uh, helpful resources. If you're interested in entrepreneurship, I think entrepreneurship is awesome. I, I love it. Um, I think it's it's a lot of fun, but it's not for everyone. Some helpful resources here: uh, incubators in town, um, good stuff. Uh, uh, hackathons. I don't know if you know about hackathons, but they have them around, and they're very tied in with the entrepreneurship community. Um, angel investors and, 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 and networks. There's entrepreneurship clubs. Um, uh, food camp isn't, and or bar camp here in town isn't isn't a bad uh, place for that. Um, uh, and business uh, development consultants, and there can be some some good around um, hacker spaces. There's, um, uh, for example, this uh, creative cafe, um, just 
blooming with ideas. They do a, a brisk business there with 3D printing, for example. Um, and you know, uh, many of these space, places can, can help give you advice, contacts, etc. cetera. Um, here at the U of S, Collabs, do you know Collabs? It's another, another nice little incubator. It's right over in Innovation Place. Um, it's in the concourse building. Basically, they have a bunch of different companies uh, affiliated with them. Some have like small breakout rooms, like sort of like this. Some have just open desks where they can sit and and uh, talk with clients or talk with advisors. They have uh, suggestions as far as uh, uh, promotional materials and that sort of stuff. Um, and I believe they may have boardrooms, etc. There's this Brett Wilson Entrepreneurship Center that um, was also quite uh, active in their entrepreneurship classes in Edwards School of Business, although I'd caution to not specifically software entrepreneurship. And local hackathons are good. I also provide some, some links to these MIT resources that I was familiar with, which are, are really, really uh, good. Joe Hatsima was uh, one of the advisors for my, comp of my first company, um, uh, but there's some, some great resources there. Uh, for you to check out as well. Okay, so that's that's all I'm going to uh, talk about on the entrepreneurship space, and uh, I'd be glad to you know answer questions offline if there's any interest at any point.